It's a great honour to be here, so I want to talk a little bit about what makes this remarkable planet that we could evolve in and contemplate our future within. So yes, the Earth's a remarkable jewel in space, thriving with life, including us, complex life forms that need an oxygen-rich atmosphere to breathe that is the byproduct of past life. We're kind of sandwiched between two very inhospitable worlds. Um, Venus on the inside, nearer the sun, where the runaway greenhouse effect has left it hot enough to melt lead at the surface of the planet. And this is probably pretty much the only photo we have from the surface of Venus shortly before the lander probe and its camera melted, essentially. <laughs> um, on the outside, further from the sun, is Mars, a kind of cold, arid wasteland. It looks superficially like parts of the Earth, uh, but the red colour in the sky especially gives it away. I say superficially like parts of the Earth. Whoop. Let's see if this works. That's the Atacama Desert, so that's on the Earth, but what, this is the driest place on the land surface of the Earth. And the blue in the sky gives away the fact that we have an oxygen and nitrogen-rich atmosphere, which is a bizarre chemical anomaly in the solar system. And, of course, most of the Earth is... Uh, abundant with liquid water and life. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story, I guess, about the history of the Earth. Just talk you through some of the pivotal changes that have happened to turn our world from something that started in the same way as um, Mars and Venus into this flourishing place of life today. So central in this story are just three um, key revolutionary events, but each of them is driven by yeah, essentially a biological in innovation and a very rare or special one uh, that increases the energy and material th flows through the whole biosphere or the whole Earth system, if you like, and that ultimately cause dramatic changes in the planet, including its climate. Um, each of these revolutions is kind of dependent on the previous one, and we needed all of them to happen for us to be here and be having this conversation today. Don't worry, we'll come to the future at the end. <laughs> now, time scales are kind of so enormous, they're hard to get your head around with Earth history. We're talking about four and a half billion years. So if um, each of your heartbeats actually lasted a year and you were to live to be 100 years old, to be a centenarian, then when you're 100, looking back, you'll your, your lifespan then is equivalent to the four and a half billion years of Earth history. And as we go through, I may try to refer to the Earth on that kind of human time scale. So the Earth was born with the rest of the solar system uh, four and a half billion years ago around a sun that was fainter than it is today, giving out about 30% less light. The Earth formed from the collision of rocks gravitationally accreting in this spinning disk of uh, dust and matter around the early sun. One of the early collisions was with a Mars-sized planetesimal, we called it, and it spat out what we think of as, or we now know as the moon. So when the moon started life, it was much closer to the Earth, um, as you'll see there. But we now know that the Earth gained its liquid water very early. So the water was partly outgassed from the interior of the young planet, and much of it also arrives on meteorites, a kind of haphazard delivery process. So those meteorites weren't all bad, those co early collisions. But the early Earth, with its liquid water, was getting pummeled by rocks from space such that if life were, did begin, it would have been sterilised, because some of those impacts were enough to evaporate the whole oceans. There's a phase called the late heavy bombardment, which left the craters that we, many of the craters we still see on the moon today. But that ends in real time about 3.8 billion years ago, or kind of in the teenage years, if the, uh, if you, if the Earth is a 100-year-old person. And remarkably soon after the end of this pummeling with rocks, we have the first um, convincing evidence for life on the planet. And it's the origin of life, and then the origin of a, a global biosphere of recycling elements that is 
the first revolution in the Earth's history. So this, the origin of life is presumed difficult, although it did happen surprisingly soon after it could, in some sense, on the Earth. Our records of it are maybe a little scant, but we have some remarkable um, evidence. This is from three and a quarter billion years ago. This is early bacterial cells fossilized in the act of cell division, peered at down the microscope there. So that's a remarkable image of some of our earliest ancestors. And we know that those early cells, this is a world entirely of bacteria, were, making, were forming communities, were making physical structures, just as these uh, microbial mats in Shark Bay of Australia are still doing today. And we find the rock record equivalents of these structures. We call them stromatolites in the ancient fossil record. Um, crucially, life needs an energy source as well as materials. And on the earliest Earth, um, instead of the familiar kind of photosynthesis we know now, there were kind of earlier forms of photosynthesis that used um, gases like hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide to supply electrons. But those gases are pretty rare things in today's world, and they would still have been rare back then. So the whole productivity of the global biosphere was limited by initially by the supplies of those kind of rare and reactive gases. And the trick that early life must have pulled off was to evolve ways of recycling all the materials it needed to build itself or to build the early biosphere, including that hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide gas. And we still have today, like in this hot pool, this sulfurous hot pool, um, organisms, bacteria forming, performing these same early kinds of photosynthesis. Um, and that origin of recycling and the consequent uh, changes in the world's chemistry, which included boosting up the methane levels in the atmosphere and creating a nice warm early climate, that kind of marks the first revolution. We then, um, artists can draw impressions of this world. It's known as the Archean world, after in Archea in the beginning. Um, and I think it was a world thriving with life, but it wasn't as productive as the biosphere we know now. Our estimates are that it's maybe a hundredth, maybe a thousandth of today's productivity. The next big revolution is, is the oxygen revolution. And, the biolog and that's kind of in Earth's middle age, incredibly. So it takes a long, long time until about maybe 2.7 billion years ago, something like 40 years old in the life of this 100-year-old planet person, before the first so-called cyanobacteria evolve. And these are the first organisms that performed the kind of photosynthesis we're all familiar with. And that means it uses water, basically, as its source of electrons, which is going to stick on the carbon and carbon dioxide and make its body out of. These are modern colonial cyanobacteria, um, they also fix nitrogen, these guys, so they're pretty, pretty smart and doing amazing chemical things. And their earliest ancestors, we date back now, as I said, maybe 2.7 billion years. And this new innovation was, was important because once you're using water for photosynthesis, you're not limited by the supply of water on this planet. And suddenly the productivity of the biosphere, we think it went up at least tenfold, possibly a hundred, possibly a thousandfold. And it had consequences, because these little guys, the cyanobacteria, are putting out oxygen as a waste product, which ultimately accumulates in the atmosphere. Now, there are some interesting dynamics, which I'm not going to baffle you with scientifically, but it turns out that the oxygen level doesn't rise immediately. Uh, there's a few hundred million years where there's perfectly stable oxygen production and low concentrations, and then there's an abrupt change that geochemists called the Great Oxidation. It's a radical rise in the oxygen content of the planet's atmosphere from like a hundred thousandth of what it is today to something like a tenth. Still not enough for you and I to breathe, but uh, we'll see it has some important biological consequences. It also, also has some very obvious geological consequences. So we've got a picture there of uh, southern African red beds, great kind of mountains or canyons of rusted iron that were produced, these ones at least, uh, by, at, at the time of that great oxidation. So this rise of oxygen completely overturns the Earth's chemistry. Perhaps not surprisingly, it leads to some big disruptions in the global carbon cycle and the Earth's climate. 
So again, in Earth's middle age, or 2.2 billion years ago, we see the first evidence that there was a very cold spell where glaciers and sea ice reached down to the equator and created, created this so-called snowball Earth where the whole planet was frozen over. So life obviously got through that, and we wouldn't be here to talk about it. Um, and in fact, stability is kind of re-established by a couple of billion years ago. Uh, Earth still in middle age, if you like. And then we come to the, the third and final pivotal um, revolution in Earth history, uh, which I'm calling the complexity revolution. This one's a bit of a slow burner um, because it, has to, it starts with the origin of complex cells, eukaryote cells, of, as they're called, of which you and I are made and of which all fungi, animals, plants are made. Um, in this more oxygen-rich world that's being created by the waste products of the cyanobacteria, um, now there's effectively more chemical energy around for life. And that is, some, is somehow linked to the origin of these first complex cells. Here we see some roughly, these are roughly two centimetres across, or the size of a 2p piece, but some of the earliest fossil evidence for what might be our first eukaryote ancestors. Um, they're about 1.8 billion years old, those ones. There's a well-known textbook biology story um, elucidated by Lynn Margulis of how eukaryote complex cells are formed, but the essence of it is that they're a fusion of previous free-living um, bacteria. So they're a remarkable uh, evolutionary fusion which is so improbable and rare that it's only happened once in the four and a half billion year history of the Earth. There's then some subsequent acquisition in some eukaryotes of cyanobacteria to form the first algae, um, for also photosynthesizing. Now, we don't know when that happened, and scientists will debate this till the cows come home, but it may be around two billion years ago. And yet, there then ensues not a lot happening through Earth's kind of 50s and 60s, if you like, uh, middle to old age. There's an interval that the geologists call the boring billion because there's so little uh, th happening in the rock record that we begin to see the first seaweeds, kind of little red algae fossils, 1.2 billion years ago. But something about the Earth's environment, the low oxygen levels, maybe hydrogen, toxic hydrogen sulfide made it intermediate depths in the ocean was, was slowing the evolution of life. The first ancestors of some kind of animal, in fact the first ancestors of sponges, we think are starting to appear about 750 million years ago. And then um, kind of all hell breaks loose. We have another couple of snowball earth events. And somehow these ancestors of complex life, these early sponges, get through them with everything else. And then in the aftermath of the snowball earth, we know that the oceans became oxygenated at depth for the first time. We argue and maybe infer that there's some rise in oxygen in the atmosphere or possibly an increase in nutrient concentrations. But what we can say is there's kind of a remarkable correlation. Out of the turmoil of snowball earth comes the first fossil evidence of sort of large complex life forms. So these are, you can probably just about make them out. These are a couple of different species, if you like, fossil fronds. They're about 20 centimetres long of what are known as Ediacarans, possibly the first um, more complex animal life forms on the planet around 600 million years ago, before the, well before the famous Cambrian explosion. We're still debating and not quite sure exactly what kind of life form they are. But for the next couple of hundred million years, complex life has got going, and it's evolving, but it's evolving in the ocean until by, by, by sort of 450 million years ago, which is when our Earth 100-year-old is about 90 already, we have finally the colonization of the land by plants. Uh, and with that, a kind of doubling of the global productivity of the biosphere, a final rise of oxygen up to modern levels, and the kind of establishment of what I think of as the familiar complex uh, system or complex Gaia with recycling of nutrients and so forth on land as well as in the ocean. So if we were to look back over those very quickly sketched uh, revolutions in our history, those revolutions that, um, if, you sent, if you think of it this way, were required for us to be here at all, to make the oxygen 
rich atmosphere that we need to breathe and the stable climate we enjoy. Well, we can review this. There's basically each of them has got some rare biological innovation behind it that starts in a single organism but ultimately changes the world profoundly. Um, they're involving step changes in the information processing by life. So information processing and communication, if you like, are pivotal here. Step changes in the complexity of the organization of life and in its energy capture and the corresponding material flows through the whole planet, the whole biosphere. But for these to be revolutionary changes, they need the Earth system itself to have some propensity to instability so that the new waste products that life is creating can cause catastrophic changes in the climate and the whole planet. And then all hell breaks loose, and it only ends in the past when evolution kind of finds ways of closing the recycling loops of all the materials that life needs, and a new stable carbon cycle and climate ensues. So, what about you and I? We are very, very, very recent arrivals in this long history. If we went with my um, lifespan of 100, compressing Earth's history into that of a 100-year-old person, then um, Homo sapiens are arriving something like a, a week ago, I think. Certainly, <laughs> certainly they're recent. And of course, we've caused a lot of uh, trouble since then. But let's just ask the question, could we possibly fulfill these criteria to be the agents of another revolutionary change of our planet, our Earth system, or Gaia if you prefer? Um, I think it's conceivable. We meet all these conditions. We have, there is an unusual biological innovation in our history that people are still, scientists are still trying to understand, but we have an extraordinary language or communication faculty that we don't see in any other organism. We all share an apparently genetically encoded um, natural language capability, including um, deaf mute people who've evolved sign languages that obey the same um, universal grammar. So something special about our communication ability as well as our opposable thumbs and our general uh, technological creativeness is allow has allowed us to change the world. By 10,000 years ago, whoops, having a few battery troubles. Of, yeah, it could indeed be a very big picture. A an artist, perhaps a little dated artist's impression of, of the, agri the agricultural origin the Neolithic revolution. So as the last ice age is ending, we we find ways of more efficiently tapping solar energy, um, boosting the energy input to our societies, but still through good old solar energy capture by plants. But that allows um, essentially the rise of the first civilizations, like this is one of the cities, ancient cities from Sumerian times that's in modern day Iraq that was thriving roughly 6,000 years ago. And this represents the evolution of a new level of organization or complexity in life or biology that's not been seen before. The city-state with division of labor, and I'm afraid that includes an army to go out and uh, fight off other city-states. Still, you can get to 400 years ago in the Dutch Golden Age, and we're still essentially subsist um, running our civilization and trying to advance it on um, solar energy captured by plants into biomass, either that we eat as food or burn to heat our homes or try to start industry. And that was a fundamentally limited system. But as we all know, um, something called the Rev Industrial Revolution happened. So this is James Watt's model of a new common steam engine, which he was using to try and work out a more efficient steam engine, which he duly did, and it played a pivotal role in the Industrial Revolution, which of course is about fossil fuels, but it's also about these new technologies and almost a new kind of social model that um, in England at least uh, exploded through positive feedback, I think, to self-propel an extraordinary change in material and energy consumption that we're still kind of uh, feeling our way through and is still ramping up. So it's self-evident that as a species, we've already transformed the energy and material flows in the biosphere. 
we've more than um, doubled, probably trebled the phosphorus input to the biosphere, done the same thing for nitrogen, and of course are having a big effect on the global carbon cycle. So we're meeting all those criteria to be the agents of revolutionary change, whether you see it as good or bad. The final one is whether the Earth uh, is prone to instability. So here's a trace from an Antarctic ice core of the last 650,000 years. This is a measure in white of the temperature and in blue of the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere. You see they kind of go in lockstep, as they should with our familiar climate theory, and we have these ice ages and then warm interglacials in between them, and this amazing sawtooth oscillation of the whole climate with our ancestors evolving down here and starting agriculture just as we come out of the last ice age. But if we were to take this, the numbers and the scales of this plot, and I showed it to a cardiologist and asked him how healthy the patient was, or I took it to an electrical engineer and I said, is this a stable circuit output? I think they'd say no. They'd say, well, no, this is a classic case of a system where it's verging on instability. The amplifiers, the positive feedbacks in this system are starting to take over from the negative feedbacks, the damping, self-regulating processes. The negative feedbacks are still just about holding the bounds of the oscillation. But, for example, at the end of ice ages, we're seeing very rapid, almost tipping point climate change because the positive feedbacks have got the upper hand, at least temporarily. So, in short, the Earth is unusually unstable at the moment. Just at the time that we evolve, have our various revolutions, especially the industrial one, and start pumping up the CO2 levels now to 400 parts per million and escalating all the time. So, we have there all the kind of ingredients that could make us agents of a fundamental transformation of this planet, this Gaia, this Earth system. So where, where are we going? Well, of course, kind of the dominant cultural narrative, I, I find, maybe I'm influenced by pessimists, but seems to be one of apocalypse, that this is not going to end well. This is an image from the movie of the, the fantastic book, The Road, and a very apocalyptic image it is too. And uh, I have spent much of the last 10 years busy in my office plotting out what are the potential tipping points in the Earth system and in the climate that our activities might trigger. So I feel like one of the horse people of the apocalypse quite a lot of the time because I know we could trigger fundamental jumps, changes, abrupt shifts in the Earth's dynamics. Um, so the, the, threat is, the threat or the risk is real that we are changing the world. One response to that is a very natural one and one that I've kind of been part of and waving the placards myself for, through my life is to say let's retreat and I think we heard that from David Holmgren a minute ago that let's rein in our energy use and our material consumption and find some new more equable lower impact state on the planet that's all very well, but I'm going to differ because that flies in the face of all the trends that have unfolded in my lifetime and are unfolding now. Energy use still escalating, population set to stabilise mid-century, but we can't pull the rug of energy and material supply from underneath what are bound to be 9 or 10 billion people on this planet quite soon in my and your lifetime. So it may be that we're thinking about the fact that energy isn't a bad thing fundamentally, it's just how you source it. And I think there is the possibility that we can be the agents of a, a positive revolutionary change for our planet that's positive for us and is, works for the rest of the biosphere. Now that's going to have to be supplied or fueled or powered by sustainable energy sources of which solar power is once again the obvious one and the biggest source of all such a big source that, it, that through our um, solar technology, these panels are 1,100 times more efficient than plants at converting sunlight into, in this case, electricity or usable energy. So solar power has the potential to allow quite a lot of growth in global energy consumption. Now, obviously, that would be a horror story if we didn't also fix our relationship with material cycling. But I believe it is possible to go into a high 
a higher level of sustainable energy use in the future, as long as we're using some of that sustainably sourced energy to be very, very efficient at recycling all the materials we need to eat, to, thrive, to survive, but also to thrive and to build and remake all the bits and bobs of our civilization. And that's the paradigm of industrial ecology, as it's called. I actually, to me, it's also, in my, maybe I'm wrong in my interpretation, but also where, where you come in. I think permaculture can be a key part of this vision. We've got a difficult uh, century to get through. There's no doubt about that. But there is a thriving, healthy future for us and for the rest of the planet uh, if we work together. Thank you.